1st January 1942. The German advance in Russia had been halted by tenacious resistance and the onset of winter, and the invaders had turned against the civilian population, hoping that terror tactics would succeed where conventional warfare had failed. Villagers, men, women, and children, had been summarily executed and the young girls forced into prostitution serving the German soldiers. These atrocities did not soften the Russians, but created a hatred for the invaders and a desire for revenge that was to last until the day Soviet tanks raced into Berlin more than three years later. Allied forces cut off Italians at City Soleil. In the North African desert, the Italian forces under the command of General Graziani was relentlessly being pushed back into Saranica. After taking 25,000 prisoners in Tobruk, it became clear to the British that the Italians intended to pull out of Saranica altogether. The British General O'Connor decided to cut off the Italians' escape by establishing an armored roadblock southwest of Benghazi in the Bita Farm, City Soleil area. A small force of only 2,000 men was dispatched and managed to reach the coast of City Soleil on the morning of 5th of February 1941, cutting off the Italian retreat, capturing 20,000 men. Battle of Bita Farm finally over and Italians surrender. After victories at Mazus and Benghazi, the next target was Bita Farm, just north of Agadabia. The Italian forces were now being driven south from Benghazi by Australian troops, whilst British forces were advancing from Mazus, thereby creating a trap from which there was no escape. The Italians surrendered on the 9th of February, 1941. In a campaign lasting only 10 weeks, the Allies had advanced 800 kilometers, destroyed the Italian 10th Army, and taken 130,000 prisoners at a cost to themselves of 550 killed or missing, and 1,373 wounded. RAF Raid on Bremen. The RAF had been stretched during the Battle of Britain, but after September 1940, the tide was slowly turning in the war in the air. By early 1941, it was time for the Royal Air Force to go over to the offensive yes, and a number of bombing Operation raids were planned Night. against German targets in continental Europe. One of the earliest and most obvious targets was the city of Bremen, which was raided on the 17th of February. It could be argued that the military benefits of this raid were limited, but the propaganda value was enormous and the boost to British morale was invaluable. The country was beginning to feel safe from invasion. Deutsche Afrika Corps formed with Rommel as commander. Hitler had become increasingly concerned with the Italians' performance in North Africa and thought he had to take steps. The first German reinforcements arrived in Tripoli on the 12th of February, 1941. The main force being a single general and his two staff officers. But it was a general that would have more impact than many divisions. He was Erwin Johannes Eugen Rommel, the Desert Fox. A week later, on the 19th of February, Rommel was appointed commander of the newly formed Deutsche Afrika Corps, and over the coming months and years, his battles with Montgomery's 8th Army became almost legendary. What is Blitzkrieg? The German military tactic known as Blitzkrieg had been extremely successful in the campaigns against Poland in 39 and against France the following year. Blitzkrieg, in all its brilliant simplicity, relies on fast-moving armor that attack the enemy's weaker positions in order to break through and thereby encircle the main force. The use of cumbersome artillery is abandoned in favor of air support, particularly dive bombers, such as the famous Junker 87, the Stuka. 
simple and efficient, but relying on decisive and courageous commanders, such as the Panzer General Heinz Guderian. Lend-Lease Bill signed in Washington. The United States was, prior to Pearl Harbor, reluctant to involve its own troops in the war against the Axis powers. Winston Churchill had, through negotiations with Franklin D. Roosevelt, tried to obtain American support, and the President's compromise solution was a financial cooperation that might achieve victory for the Allies without direct involvement. On the 11th of March, 1941, the U.S. Congress passed the Lend-Lease Act appropriating an initial $7 billion to lend or lease weapons and other vital aid to designated countries. Britain was the main early recipient, and after the German invasion, the Soviet Union also benefited greatly. Yugoslavia joins the Axis. Hitler had given an ultimatum to Yugoslavia, sign a pact guaranteeing her boundaries in return for neutrality or else. On the 25th of March, 1941, the Yugoslav leader, Sinkar Markovic, and Adolf Hitler signed the tripartite pact in a ceremony so lacking in the festive spirit that the Fuhrer likened it to a funeral. But Hitler and the Prince Regent, Paul, had misread the mood of the Serbian people. Two days later, tanks moved into the center of Belgrade and the radio announced a palace coup, exiling Paul, replacing him with the 17-year-old King Peter II and the renunciation of the pact with Germany. Rommel attacks Mirza Brega. General Erwin Rommel had flown to Berlin on the 19th of March to explain his intentions to attack to Hitler and his staff. Hitler was skeptical and flatly forbade any such action. When Rommel returned to North Africa, he immediately proceeded to disobey orders and launched all forward units of the Fifth Light Division against the fort and landing ground at El Aguila. A few days later, on the 31st of March, Rommel now attacked Mirza Brega with the excuse to his superiors in Berlin that the water supply was better there. What, in fact, he had done was to take advantage of the British hesitancy to gain valuable territory. Rommel takes Agadabia. Rommel was still disobeying his superiors with some verve in North Africa. He had direct orders from the high command in Berlin not to advance, but chose to ignore the desk generals and pressed ahead against the British Eighth Army. Having taken the town of Mirza Brega on the 31st of March, 1941, he decided to carry on the offensive as he hadn't as yet encountered any British armor, apparently held back as the British wanted a clear indication of the enemy's intentions. On the 2nd of April, the German 5th Light quickly crossed the 40 kilometers between Mirza Brega and Agadavia, where Rommel could set up his new headquarters the following day. Rommel appeared to have it all his own way. Germany invades Yugoslavia and Greece. It had seriously angered Adolf Hitler that the Serb population had rejected the agreement signed between Germany and Yugoslavia. On the 6th of April, 1941, Operation Punishment and Operation Marita were launched simultaneously against Yugoslavia and Greece. The offensive got underway with spectacular strikes by the Luftwaffe. Belgrade was hit at 5.30 in the morning, and throughout that day and the next, bombs were raining down on the city and killing 17,000 people. 800 kilometers further south, a similar attack was made against Piraeus, and the invasion by the Germans of Yugoslavia and Greece was underway. The Deutsche Afrika Corps surrounds Tobruk. In North Africa, things are still going well for Rommel. He had captured everything between El Aguila and Gazala. His reconnaissance group had reached Fardia, close to the Egyptian border, isolating Tobruk. 
Tobruk was mainly defended by Australian infantry that had been forced out of Benghazi, but was later reinforced by Indian and British troops and commanded by the Australian Major General, Leslie Moreshead. Rommel's first attack took place on the 10th and 11th of April and was just an attempt to bounce the defenders out, but a sandstorm and accurate artillery fire stopped the assault and Rommel withdrew and the early battle for Tobruk became a siege. Belgrade falls to German forces. The heavy bombardment by the German Luftwaffe of Belgrade on the 6th of April had destroyed much of the city's defenses and it was now vulnerable to the advancing German panzer divisions. The first strike had come from the 9th Panzer Division that had taken Stipp and Skopje on the 7th of April, and by the 10th, Zagreb was in German hands, and the 8th Panzer Division was driving towards Belgrade, which fell on the 13th of April. The task of the Germans had been made easier by the inherent conflict between the Croats and the Serbs, and now Croat Ustazi formations threw down their arms and on occasions even joined the advancing Germans. Greek First Army trapped in the Metsavon Pass and surrenders. The Axis powers' attack on Greece in the spring of 1941 had caught the defenders completely unprepared for the fight to come. Though valorous, the Greeks were poorly trained and even worse equipped. When the Germans broke through the Monaster Gap in the north of the country, the Greeks and their British allies could only fight a rearguard action. The rapid movement of the German forces prevented the Greek First Army from retreating, and it was trapped in the Metsavon Pass, close to the Albanian border. The encircled army fought bravely, but the result was inevitable, and they had to surrender on the 22nd of April. German troops enter Athens. In Greece, the Greek and Commonwealth forces were aware that their fight against the Germans was lost and everything else was damage limitation. They were planning to evacuate to Crete. Australian and British troops were streaming back past Thermopylae where a rear guard dug in positions to hold back the advancing Germans for as long as possible. They managed to hold out until the 24th of April 1941, then slipped away, leaving the route to Athens virtually open. On the 26th of April, the British commander crossed to Peloponnese, preceded by more than 40,000 men, and the following day, German troops entered Athens. Germans capture Maleme airfield on Crete. After the fall of Greece, the Commonwealth forces stationed there had retreated to Crete. The Germans considered that the Greek island was of considerable strategical importance and set about capturing it. On the 20th of May, 1941, the largest airborne assault to date is mounted, supported by gliders and shallow draft cutters, and despite heavy fire from the defending New Zealanders, the Germans managed to gain a foothold. On the 21st of May, the Germans' determined effort results in them taking the important airfield at Maleme in northern Crete and can now make use of their Junker 52 transport plane to bring in reinforcements. Bismarck engaged in battle with the British Navy in the Denmark Strait. The German battleship Bismarck was thought one of the most powerful naval vessels ever built. After sea trial, the Bismarck had left Gdynia and was spotted on the 23rd of May going down through the Denmark Strait. Vice Admiral L. E. Holland was aboard HMS Hood and with the Prince of Wales and six destroyers close by. When within range, the Hood and the Prince of Wales opened fire, only to be greeted by brilliant flashes from Bismarck's massive cannons and its fifth salvo scored a direct hit on the hood, which sank in minutes, taking all but three of the 1,419 crew with her. Airborne Assault on Crete The German plan for the invasion of Crete allowed for the landing of 22,750 men, 750 by glider, 
10,000 by parachute, 5,000 in air transport, and 7,000 by sea. The assault had started on the 20th of May, 1941, and the battles that ensued were to go on for the next seven days. The German losses were initially extremely high, but the tide was to change. However stubbornly the Allied troops fought, the German offensive proved too powerful in the end, and Crete fell on the 27th of May. The Bismarck is finally sunk. The German battleship Bismarck was picked by the radar of the cruiser Sheffield coming up from Gibraltar. At 10.36 on the morning of the 26th of May, a Catalina spotted the German battleship 800 miles from Brest, and a British force nearby, including the Ark Royal, attacked that night. Fifteen swordfish from the Ark Royal launched 13 torpedoes and two scored hits, one wrecking the Bismarck's steering gear and jamming the main rudder. Partially helpless, several more hits went in, and at 10.15, the order was given to shuttle the ship, and she went down, taking 2,000 of her complement with her. The night before Operation Barbarossa. On the evening of the 21st of June, 1941, three German army groups made up of 80 infantry divisions, 18 panzer divisions, 12 motorized divisions, reserves of a further 21 infantry, two panzer and one motorized division, were poised to start Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the Soviet Union that was to be launched the following morning. Hitler had declared, when Barbarossa is launched, the whole world will hold its breath. And indeed, the forces announced from the Arctic Circle to the Black Sea represented the biggest concentration of military force the world had seen, and the war that ensued would impact on the world for decades to come. Finland declares war on the Soviet Union. The Germans had launched the massive Operation Barbarossa on the 22nd of June, 1941, when more than two million men crossed the borders into the Soviet Union. This was blitzkrieg on an enormous scale, and in the first early days, it could easily appear as if the USSR would share fate with Poland and France. As the Panzers rolled forward, apparently unstoppable, and the Luftwaffe put paid to Soviet airfields and aircraft, few observers doubted that the Germans would be in Moscow before the winter set in. Apparently, the Finnish government did, because on the 26th of June, they declared war on the Soviet Union and started the so-called Continuation War. Germans occupy Riga. Operation Barbarossa had gotten off to a flying start, but the speed of the Panzer divisions posed a problem for the infantry. As the Germans approached the borders to the Baltic states, Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, that problem was temporarily solved as the marshy terrain close to the old borders made progress very slow, even for the motorized infantry. Fortunately, chaos and confusion reigned throughout the Soviet forces in this sector, and the drive towards the Baltic could still continue. Once the German panzer arrived in the Baltic states themselves, things improved as the roads here were better and the Germans could occupy Riga, the capital of Latvia, on the 1st of July, 1941. Molotov and the British ambassador to the Soviet Union signed Treaty of Mutual Support. The period leading up to the Second World War, and for a couple of years after the start, was one of contradictory diplomatic activities. Treaties were negotiated, signed and broken as the fortunes of war shifted. The German envoy, von Rippentrop, had visited Moscow and signed a non-aggression pact with Joseph Stalin, and less than two years later, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa. On the 12th of July, 1941, yet another treaty was signed, though this one was to last through to the end of the war. Now having a common enemy, the Soviet foreign minister, Molotov, and the British ambassador signed a mutual support treaty in Moscow. Smolensk, taken by Army Group Center. 
the german campaign in the soviet union was going extremely well during the summer of one nine hundred forty one army group north had reached the baltic and army group south was on the river dnieper in the middle army group center had captured the important city of minsk the red army was aware that moscow was under serious threat and panzer group three which spearheaded the german advance experienced three weeks of their hardest fighting ever before reaching smolensk on the fifteenth of july the determination shown here by the red army did not gain them any victories but as was evidenced later slowed down the germans sufficiently to in reality save moscow japan prepares for invasion of southern indochina indochina was a french colony at the outbreak of the second world war when france fell to the germans in nineteen forty it was a chance for Japan to continue the imperialistic expansion program it had embarked on. The plans for the Japanese invasion of Indochina were finalized on the 22nd of July, 1941, and the following day, imperial forces landed in the country. The occupation resulted in President Roosevelt's decision to cease all trade with Japan. There is little doubt that this action was an opportunity for the hawks in the Japanese government to justify a preemptive strike against the USA, and it hence led directly to Pearl Harbor. U.S. Oil Embargo Against Japan The Japanese invasion of Indochina had angered the American administration. Asian imperialism was most definitely anathema to most, if not all, Western powers. The Sino-Japanese War and the establishment of Manchukuo had already angered both Great Britain and the USA. When Japan then invaded southern Indochina on the 22nd of July, 1941, to secure the raw materials from the area, the U.S. imposed an oil embargo on Japan two days later, on the 24th of July. Considering that Japan had no direct access to oil, this action could be seen as an invitation to war. Atlantic Declaration. Between the 9th and 12th of August, 1941, Prime Minister Winston Churchill and President Franklin D. Roosevelt met on the warships, the Prince of Wales and the Augusta in Argentia Bay, Newfoundland. This meeting produced a remarkable document, the Atlantic Charter. This was basically a statement of principles for which the Second World War was being fought and will no doubt be part of history for centuries to come. The charter was drafted by Churchill and developed by the two statesmen together and it was subsequently incorporated into a Declaration of the United Nations. It is, in its own way, as historic as the Magna Carta or the Declaration of Independence. Soviet evacuates Karelian Isthmus. In 1939, the Soviet Union demanded that Finland cede Karelia, and when the Finns refused, Soviet armies invaded the country, initiating the Winter War. Though the Finns fought bravely, they eventually had to sue for peace in March 1940. The Soviet Union gained control over Karelia, but had to evacuate the area on the 29th of August, 41, when the Germans, after launching Operation Barbarossa, had designated Leningrad as one of their main targets. The aim was to shorten any potential front and offer the former capital better protection. Leningrad is under siege and faces starvation. The Russian city of Novgorod, which was blocking the German army's drive towards Leningrad, had fallen on the 16th of August, 1941, and by the beginning of September, the former Russian capital was surrounded and under siege. This siege was to be one of the longest in history, lasting almost two and a half years and resulting in the death of some 1.25 million residents. Both military defenders and residents in the blockaded city showed ingenuity and determined bravery and created a veritable fortress that tied down thousands of German troops, but which was never penetrated.
Malta under fire. The Mediterranean island of Malta served two important purposes as a British supply base on the maritime route through the Mediterranean to and from the Suez Canal and the Far East, and as a staging point for long-range flights from the UK to the Middle East. In addition, Malta was also a convenient base for RAF reconnaissance flights covering North Africa and the Mediterranean. The island was clearly a thorn in the side of the Germans and was subject to a sustained aerial attack in September 1941, when the Luftwaffe made it the most bombed place in the world at the time. Red Army lose more than 500,000 men at Kiev Pocket. Since more than three million German troops attacked the Soviet Union on the 22nd of June 1941, nothing appeared to be able to stop their progress towards the Russian heartland and the capital Moscow. In a typical movement, Generals von Kleist's and Guderian's panzers had driven forward in a pincer movement and met at Lokvitsa, creating the biggest encirclement of the Barbarossa campaign. Stalin, who had up until this point refused to let any of Soviet forces retreat, now gave the much-needed permission. But it was too late, as more than 500,000 Red Army soldiers were either killed or taken prisoner. German troops capture Kiev. The German Army Group South, commanded by General von Rundstedt, had benefited from the services of two outstanding panzer commanders, Kleist and, not least, Heinz Guderian. Both played significant roles as the German pincer closed just east of the city of Kiev, trapping more than half a million Soviet troops. Though the Soviet garrison in Kiev itself fought determinedly, being under order from Joseph Stalin not to retreat, their time was up and the Germans captured the city only 10 days after the creation of the pocket on the 26th of September, 1941. North Atlantic Convoys. The Atlantic convoys were a lifeline for both Great Britain and the Soviet Union as both countries relied on vital war supplies from the USA. But with the convoys came the U-boats. The Germans, under the watchful eye of Admiral Donitz, had started a comprehensive building and training program, and their U-boat wolf packs had started to make serious inroads in the North Atlantic freighter traffic. During 1941, U-boats alone sank each month some 36 Allied ships, totaling around 180,000 tons, and it was to last well into 1943 before the Allies really came to grips with this underwater menace. Operation Typhoon. Operation Typhoon was the code name for the latter part of the German offensive against Moscow by Army Group Center, after a standstill of some six weeks, the drive towards the Soviet capital was resumed on the 2nd of October, 1941. Von Bloch was naturally aware that he had limited time to reach his objective as the Russian winter was looming. Within two weeks, the Germans had indeed completed three large encirclements and taken 663,000 Soviet prisoners, and it could appear that the fall of Moscow was imminent. But then the autumn rains turned the unpaved roads to mud, and the advance was halted, only to be overtaken by the infamous Russian winter within a month. Kanoya's government in Japan resigns, and General Hideki Tojo becomes prime minister. Prince Fumamaro Kanoya had become prime minister of Japan in 1937, shortly before the Sino-Japanese War. Although he resigned in 1938 as a protest against Japanese militarism, he was again chosen as prime minister in 1940 when he aligned Japan with the Axis powers. Before Pearl Harbor, he offered to negotiate with the Americans, but was forced to resign on the 8th of October, 1941, by the hawks within government. Kanoya's replacement was the militarist and advocate of total war, General Hideki Tojo, 
who also had the ear of the Emperor Hirohito. The Soviet T-34 proves more than a match for the German Panzer. When Germany invaded the Soviet Union in June 1941, the Red Army had more tanks than the rest of the world put together. And more importantly, they had already developed a medium tank that was destined to become a war winner, the T-34. The German Panzerkampfwagen 3 and 4 had so far carried all before them, but the T-34 was far superior, being faster, better armored, more flexible, and less prone to failure. The T-34 quickly earned the reputation as the best tank on any battlefield in World War II. Marshal Zhukov is appointed commander during the defense of Moscow. Marshal Georgi Konstantinovich Zhukov was probably the Soviet Union's most famous soldier and certainly one of the most talented, never losing a battle throughout his career, though he was involved in most of his country's important battles during World War II. When the German armies were threatening Moscow, the Red Army naturally called on their best men, and on the 21st of October 1941, Zhukov was appointed as defender of the Soviet capital. The campaign that followed would become famous as it was the first indication of German vulnerability in the war. It was even more pivotal on the Eastern Front than the battle for Stalingrad. Von Bock's last ditch effort to capture Moscow is launched. Operation Typhoon, the final German assault on Moscow, had been launched on the 2nd of October 1941, and in under three weeks the famous Blitzkrieg tactic had snapped pincers on Soviet pockets only 40 miles from Moscow. Now the new commander of the Soviet Central Front, General Georgi Zhukov, organized a new defensive front and managed to halt the German advance. On the 3rd of November 1941, the German Army Group Center, commanded by von Koch, made a final all-out effort to break through the Moscow defenses, but was beaten back, opening the way for a later Soviet counterattack. Montgomery importance in the desert. There is little doubt that one of the reasons for the Germans' change of fortune in the desert was the arrival of Lieutenant General Sir Bernard Law Montgomery as commander of the British Eighth Army. This energetic general might not have had the tactical talent of his opponent, Rommel, but he did make his mark. Montgomery was not instantly popular with his men and officers. He was extremely demanding as an incident shortly after he arrived indicates. A great believer in physical fitness, he ordered a rather pear-shaped officer to run seven miles. The officer stated that this would surely kill him, to which Montgomery replied, Good, die now and we can get a fit replacement before the battle starts. 20 degrees Celsius of frost halt German drive towards Moscow. General Georgi Zhukov had been in charge of the defense of Moscow since October 1941 and had successfully brought the German drive on the capital, Operation Typhoon, to a halt and was, in addition, about to get an unexpectedly early ally. The infamous Russian winter came early in 1941 and on the 15th of November the thermometer read 20 degrees Celsius below zero. The Eastern Front literally froze. The frost did not only bring misery to the troops, but rendered much of their equipment useless. The Germans were suffering the same fate as Napoleon's armies had almost 130 years earlier. President Roosevelt offers compromise to the Japanese. It was clear that the Hawks were gaining ground within the Japanese government, and the American oil embargo gave them the extra boost. Franklin D. Roosevelt did become aware that a softening attitude was required from the United States if war was to be avoided. Though Roosevelt personally wanted a further U.S. involvement in world affairs, Congress had long favored neutrality. 
It is then ironic that the American president offers to negotiate for a compromise with the Japanese on the very same day, 26th of November 1941, that the Imperial fleet that was to attack Pearl Harbor a couple of short weeks later set sail. General Heinz Guderian's letter home. General Heinz Guderian was one of Germany's outstanding panzer commanders who had been successful during both the Polish and French campaign. The Russian campaign was also initially successful, but as the Germans were drawing closer to Moscow and the winter was nearing, the situation started to change for the worse. Mud, the frostbite, the casualties to men and tanks had reached such levels that Guderian wrote to his wife, I frequently cannot sleep at night. My brain goes round and round while I think what more I can do to help my poor soldiers who are out there without shelter. Soviet forces counterattack at Tula. The Germans' drive into the Soviet Union after the launch of Operation Barbarossa had been swift and efficient. It had been blitzkrieg at its most efficient, and by December, the German armies were poised before Moscow. But the Germans were now short of supplies and had little or no protection against the hardening Russian winter, and Stalin now ordered a counterattack to be led by his toughest troops. So by the 1st of December, 1941, the Red Army attacked the German positions at Chula, south of Moscow, and in a desperate battle in the snow, the Germans were, for the first time, driven westwards. Germany finally abandoned the attack on Moscow, too hard a nut to crack. When the Germans launched Operation Barbarossa, the attack on the Soviet Union, on the 22nd of June 1941, it was believed by their high command that Moscow would be reached and taken well before winter set in. The initial drive appeared to be on schedule, but the Soviet defenses hardened as their capital came under increasing threat. But the real turning point was when the talented General Gorgi Zirkov was appointed commander of the forces defending the city. Now the German attack was severely slowed down and winter was catching up. Less than 50 kilometers from Moscow, the invaders were finally stopped. Soviet counteroffensive at Moscow. The Soviet counteroffensive at Moscow had started on the 5th of December 1941, and on the 6th, the main push against the German positions began. The Russian mustered a total of 15 armies plus a cavalry corps, and even if a Soviet army of those days barely exceeded a German corps in manpower, this first serious fight back was nonetheless conceived on a grand scale. The Red Army was attacking forces at the end of a lengthy communications and supply line and tired from their recent efforts and ragged in freezing. As a result, the counterattack succeeded despite the lack of heavy weapons and significant armor support. Pearl Harbor. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor came just before eight o'clock on a peaceful Sunday morning. 432 bombers, torpedo bombers, and fighter aircraft had been launched from a strong Japanese fleet under the command of Vice Admiral Nagumo. There had been no official declaration of war, and the Americans were caught completely unaware with devastating results. After two short hours, 3,000 military personnel had been killed or wounded, eight battleships, 10 other naval vessels sunk or badly damaged, and almost 200 American aircraft had been destroyed. The attack marked the entrance of Japan and the United States into World War II. Large Japanese forces on their way to Luzon in the Philippines. The Japanese attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii on the 7th of December 1941 signaled the start of a larger campaign throughout the Pacific. Imperial forces landed in Thailand and Malaya the same day, and Hong Kong, Guam, Midway, and Wake Island were attacked the following day. 
On the 9th of December, a Japanese force was making its way towards the Philippines. Situated between mainland Asia and Australia, the Philippines was vital to the control of the Western Pacific, and on the 10th of December, the first Japanese troops were landed on the island of Luzon, starting a campaign that would eventually oust all American forces. USA declares war on Japan. There is still some confusion and even disagreement as to whether or not Japan intended to declare war on the USA prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Whatever may be the case, the Americans officially declared war on Japan on the 10th of December, 1941. I believe that I interpret the will of the Congress and of the people when I assert that we will not only defend ourselves to the uttermost, but will make it very certain that this form of treachery shall never again endanger us. Germany and Italy declare war on the United States. And of the people. The United States had declared war on Japan on the 10th of December 1941 as a direct consequence of the attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor a few days earlier, on the 7th of December. On the 11th of December, both Germany and Italy declared war on the United States in adherence to the so-called Berlin Pact signed in September 1940. The Berlin Pact was basically an inclusion of Japan into the 1936 Hitler-Mussolini Accord and their military alliance signed in May 1939. Hitler forbids all retreat in the Soviet Union. The three Soviet commanders, Koniev, Timoshenko, and Zhukov, have been directing attacks by large armies against the German positions outside Moscow since mid-November 1941. By the 19th of December, Hitler had issued orders that all German troops must stand fast, and when senior officers protested, they were sacked. The most senior to go was the commander-in-chief Brauchitz, whose place Hitler took himself, thereby completing the subjection of the army to his personal control. Also to go were Lieb and Bock. Only Field Marshal von Rundstedt remained as one of the few to enjoy the Fuhrer's respect. Soviet celebrates in face of the enemy. To claim that 1941 had been a difficult year for the Soviet Union would be an understatement second to none. The invasion by Germany had devastated large tracts of the country and only almost superhuman determination and sacrifices had stopped the invaders short of Moscow. The old capital of Leningrad was under threat and there were no signs that any ally would come forward in the foreseeable future. The Soviet Union was on her own, and yet this first new year celebrated at war was also a turning point from which they could begin to reclaim their country. And they did, though ultimately at a higher cost than paid by any other nation in history.